Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Cube Pod, episode 71. I'm John Furrier with Dave Vellante. Dave, salute. <laughs> Johnny boy, what's happening? I'm Good back to see in, you. Back in Great Palo Alto to, for two days. Great to see you in New York this week. Yeah, had a big, uh, did my last, the last pod in your office. I was in uh, Boston for the week, and then we went to New York for kind of soft launch of the NYSC Cube East studio linking Silicon Valley. We now have the Cube East up and running fully with NYSC on the show floor, and Boston studio in Palo Alto, California, and Silicon Valley. So just keep expanding those super nodes and, uh, you know, accesses to the local markets and where our communities are. It's, it was, it was good. It was, it was a soft launch and it turned out to be pretty bigger than, than I'd expected. We'll get to that later, but, um, yeah, I mean, just a crazy week. We got VMware Explorer, Broadcom VMware Explorer next week. We're going to touch upon that. Um, there's a big story exclusive by Reuters on, um, how Chinese are, are working around the chip ban going through the cloud because they can't get access to chip. Um, flurry of activity around AI models. Um, AMD bought ZT Systems, take on NVIDIA. Snowflake went, had some earnings, shares dropped, um, but positive earnings everywhere else. Um, I'm, I'm seeing a big GPU problem. I'm calling it the big short, the big GPU short, kind of like the housing crisis. We'll get to that. That's going to be a fun debate with you. Um, it's you know not 100% a call on my part, but there is a scenario for a big GPU short, you know, call me Michael Burry, whatever you want to call me, swapping out those, <laughs> those uh, tranches <laughs> layered in the movie. Big short was one of my favorite movies of all time. This is a great book too. Uh, and then also ironically, and this is really more karma autonomy uh, founder, Mike Lynch sadly died at sea with his family and, and advisors, but 15 people did live. And another key player in the autonomy HP scheme that got hit by a car uh, riding his bike. So the conspiracy theories are out, but Michael Lynch celebrating his acquittal of the HPE lawsuit rented a big yacht, a, a ocean tornado flipped the boat and killed everybody pretty much. So really, really sad. And we got a lot of history there, John. You remember we, we were, uh, we were we, right we, at the heart of that when Leo Apotheker bought autonomy. We can talk about that if you want. That he bought autonomy and then they had the whole fraudulent, um, revenue recognition, which even though the case was dropped, we know and confirm through multiple sources that that was actually true. Um, and then obviously, dude, you're going to love this segment because it's not a Lena Khan, but it's pretty close. Kamala Harris is uh, putting out unrealized capital gains taxes. Everybody's <laughs> freaking out. Like, what? <laughs> so, the? Like, talk about not reading the room or even being tone deaf to how business works. I mean, I was, that is I just was an absolute slicing her own throat in politics. It, uh, Liz Warren was on uh, CNBC this morning with Joe, going toe to toe with Joe Kernan. I actually put out a tweet. It was it was epic. They were just yelling at each other. It was classic, and they wouldn't let each other talk. Oh my and Liz, god! Liz was throwing out this these bogus numbers about how you know this this company who makes eggs had they had a four thousand increase in profit this that last quarter. And Joe Kernan was like, "Yeah, because they took a billion, you know, a hundred million, a billion dollar write off because of the bird flu the previous quarter. So of course the numbers were through the roof, and you know, calling her a fraud, basically. And she just sort of dug her heels in and ignored him. And then yeah. basically she made the because they're trying to do you know kind of price controls." And her comment, which of course triggered me, was we just need to give Lena Khan more power. I was like, oh my God. Oh, you know, just geez. like like they, like, that? like like the non-competes that just got overturned. Yes, she'd said that. We well, said, Thank I God mean, for Lena Khan, she said. And I was like, well, oh, I, I, mean, I was here, throwing stuff at the TV. Well, here's <laughs> the thing that bothers me. I mean, I like Kamala Harris. I mean, I don't like her as a politician, but you know, uh, as as a candidate, I was rallying around her. But the problem is, is that she's not that bright in my opinion relative to business and my, inter my interactions with the people that know her and seeing her she doesn't come across well that's why she's always scripted and that's why i don't know dude she was good last night did you see her yeah. last night that's what i'm saying i i'm not against her i'm just saying this move of saying unrealized capital yeah. gains is so bad She's I mean, just how appealing. Could, how could she's you, just appealing to people who how could you know, anyone rich with people. a brain with cognition <laughs> say that um, I would kill. Dude, she's raised a half a billion dollars in like a month. I mean, that's. Yeah, I'm not even talking about impressive. Talking about specific unrealized capital gains. It's I just, know it's, it's the just, dumbest idea I've ever. It's impossible. It's like, can you imagine trying to, to implement that? How complicated that? Would, let's make the tax code like infinitely more complicated. I mean, that's well, just stupid. It, it basically idea. would kill. It would kill anything innovative where there's appreciation in the market. You basically have to prepay your gain before you sell it. So it calls all kinds of complications. Let's just say you have stock 
and that's you, you exercise your stock options it goes up you get taxed on it and that's like remember the dot com bubble the big problem that people were weren't exercising their options they were taxed on that gain and they p- put people out of business people lost their homes their families it was a disaster so you just got to keep it the way it is maybe simplify the tax code I'm a big fan of the old Steve Forbes uh, flat tax. Personally, everyone fills out a postcard and then it's equal. You can't hide. Did you see what, did you see what Ackman said on Twitter? No. no. It was pretty interesting actually. Cause you know what she's trying to go after is like really wealthy people, um, ha- you know, multi-billionaires and what they do. And it's not just billionaires who do this. A lot of people do this. They take a loan out against their assets. So they don't have to sell the stock. Right. So during ZERP, you could take a loan out. I actually did it m- multiple times for like two and a half percent or less. You give yourself a loan instead of paying the capital gains tax. And then you do something, whatever you put it into another asset, you buy a house or, or make an improvement, home improvement, or you, whatever, buy a boat. If you want to buy a boat, that's how Bezos does it. And I'm sure other billionaires as well. So what Ackman said was, if you really want to you know, do something, do it on that event. In other words, tax the loan at a capital gains rate. And then for you know, don't tax when they actually sell the stock. So I thought that was actually pretty clever because that would that would solve the problem of because basically what the government wants to do is they don't want to let billionaires just take take the money, leave it there, you know, give it to an estate and never get the taxes. So they're trying to pull that forward. But that's a, I thought Ackman's proposal was actually a pretty clever way to pull those taxes forward and get. I you mean, know, it's revenue. Just, it's just one small sliver of a zillion ways to that rich people or super rich are, are hiding their taxes. I mean, it's just one. It's just so many things. It's just, I mean, we could talk about it. But it's a, a good one. one. We it's could, a really we good could, one. We could, we could, we could, we could, we Why pay 20% it. capital gains tax when you pay, when you could pay two and a half, three percent on, you know, taking, giving yourself a loan? It was, it yeah. was, well, the rates know, might drop. The pool. signaling might come as the rates are dropping. And, uh, oh, by the way, see the new Cube shirt I'm wearing? I like it. How how do we get one of those? I think there's going to be some shipped out to your office. So uh, I gave them my sizes, and so we can't wait to get a. I'd love to wear them to VMware Explore next week. We got to get the swag going. Um, I keep on getting told by everyone we got to get our swag game up. So we'll, we'll work on that. Um, I'm reading a quick news here. I want to just share this because it's interesting. A look at Apple. This is a Bloomberg story. A look at Apple's podcast fading dominance in April 24. They study all these podcast consumers. 31% use YouTube, followed by yeah. 21% for Spotify. 12% use Apple. I mean, we knew this. We knew Apple was losing the game because it's hard to use. It's weird. But I mean, I use, I mean, I love Spotify for music, but I, I actually listen to, I use YouTube. I mean, Me too. I guess on YouTube. Yeah. YouTube, YouTube's easy. So I think YouTube, again, another, another um, growth opportunity for YouTube. And then also yesterday in the news, um, the podcaster, um, the, um, uh, what's the podcast? Call me, uh, call me daddy or call me, call your daddy. What's it called? Call me daddy podcast. Um, got a $150 million deal with, with Sirius XM for five year deal. So that brings up the conversation around podcasts as a business and, um, these brands, you know, we always saw with the power law for AI, there's a power law for, for entertainment, right? We always get the popular podcasts and you got the, you know, the more niche podcasts like ours that are targeted. Um, you know, that's huge monetization. It's, you know, that's not huge numbers, Dave, uh, for that. So we'll, we'll see how that goes again. Spotify's you know, had some problems with their podcasting. Um, and, uh, Apple's just, I think Apple just really just never looked at it. They're not the Kings anymore. Um, but they should be, there's no reason why they should not have that business. I just think I just think iTunes and and the whole interface was terrible. I mean, they lose stuff. I mean, they started the whole thing twenty years ago. I was there when the podcast was formed. You know, that twenty years ago, I'm, I was on the front page of iTunes first week. Uh, big banner, PodTech, and uh, my podcast was really popular. And we loved iTunes. That's the only way you could get podcasts years ago, or on a blog on a flash player. You know, an embed. You know, a widget. Other than a widget, it was iTunes, the only game in town twenty years ago. They invented the category, iPod, pod, casting, radio for the iPod, now the iPhone, dominated it, lost it. So, you know, if I'm at Apple, I'm in a room, hey, Tim, get back on, on the case. I guarantee you, Steve Jobs would never let this happen. He's, he would have saw the democratization of media growing. He would have had Apple TV, 
Apple Radio and Apple Print up and running. <laughs> you know, he would have completely shifted the category to Apple. I mean, they do have a great Apple app that aggregates all the news. I do, I do like that actually. I think that's a good interface. But there's no reason, Dave, they should lose podcasting. They 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 created the category. I mean, Spotify well, won by default because everyone moved to music there because Apple Music sucked too. I mean, how many times I bought songs on Apple Music and then it, it just got weird. I couldn't download them. I had to rebuy them. I dropped all this cash and I had to resync it. So I think Spotify won that game because it's just were a better product. Spotify is great. And so now easy even, to use. Now it's even better. It's giving me good rate, great recommendations. I'm basically, by the algorithm, I'm a rock guy. I can tell by what it feeds me. Um, rock and roll is my genre. Me too. Oh, oh, that some, sometimes like on Sunday morning, I want to just listen to some jazz because I'm maybe I'm working or something. I don't want, you know, words in there. So I'll just, it, the, the the radio channels are so good. You just search like what, rock and roll radio or you do like smooth jazz radio and you get just an awesome playlist. Love Spotify. And Apple, remember last year, Apple changed its, its uh, I don't know if it was an algorithm, but it just changed the way in which, remember it would download all the episodes like automatically? all the ones that you hadn't downloaded yet, then it stopped doing that. So I don't know, maybe that affected its its position. Um, but yeah, the experience was not as good. And YouTube, you can watch. So I, I love YouTube. That's why I've, I think we we have the right format. I mean, we've always had the right format. Start with video and then turn it into a podcast. You know, when my kids were in elementary school and high school, we only had one Spotify account, so they shared it. So my algorithm was feeding me Britney Spears. You know, <laughs> all these, like, it's like, you, know, you had this weird eclectic rock and roll, and then EDM came into the mix. I And I just got this plethora of great, so the algorithm resynced me. I, I had to uninstall and reinstall, so I got the new algorithm. Um, but yeah, all good. So, you know, there's a lot of media good things going on, Dave. Let, let's get into this, um, this, um, debate I want to have with you because I think, you know, uh, it's kind of related to uh, some of the news, AMD buying ZT systems, really about NVIDIA. Um, you know, you saw, you're seeing a lot of conversation. NVIDIA's price still climbing. They went up huge the other day. Um, you have Eric Schmidt saying, you know, $300 billion of revenues coming to them in GPUs. Well, I think there's going to be a big, big, the signs that I think, and I'm say it now as a, as a haymaker, that there's going to be a big short, a big GPU short, I call it. So remember the movie, The Big Short? Michael Burry called the housing market crash, saw that the the, uh, the, uh, the tranches were layered in there, all that risk, and did the whole you know swapping thing. You know, put the uh, you saw the big movie was based upon it. I think something similar has happened with GPU. I talked to a lot of people. They can't get product. And there's a story we'll get to about the Chinese can't get access to the chips either. And they're doing a workaround with the, with the chip ban and access to the GPUs. They're going through Amazon Cloud and Azure. And they won't sell it to them because there's all kinds of stuff. So there's a, so a huge thing. So there might be there might be all these people grabbing all the GPUs and sitting on them. That could really crash. So there's conversations I'm seeing that point to the fact that you, you know, you're starting to see that if this if this becomes a problem. Then that could just gut the market out. So it could crash. The GPU market could crash, um, and it's right. it's very much like a housing crisis kind of vibe. That would kill the core weaves of the world, um, and the way they're purchasing the GPUs. If they can't get that revenue back, and there's no demand, or however that shifts, um, and how they're being financed. I mean, the money going into these companies that are GPU based are interesting and I mean, they got to pay for it. I mean, at some point you got to generate revenue. So, so, so let's, let's debate this for a little bit. I mean, I, I'm not saying that eventually there won't be an overcapacity in GPUs, but I don't see that happening in the near term. By the way, you're, I love the big short reference. It was a great <laughs> book. Great. That scene with Ryan Gosling, he had the stack of, of of blocks and the, and, the, and it was representing the tranches. It was the, and had, it was the Jenga game. The Jenga game, right? He had the A's, the B's, the C's, and all the he called it the dog shit stuff that they packaged up. And then he you know, was pulling out, you know, uh, sliding out blocks, and then all of a sudden the whole thing crashed. And then he had a uh, uh, Steve Carell was was the other guy <laughs> down. He went down to Florida and he saw all these empty homes, right? With like the TVs were were pulled off the wall and just the stuff was left there. The dogs were still there and it was just awful. He's like, you know, buy these things, you know, to sell everything. I mean, it was just crazy. 
But I don't see that in GPUs. Here's why. I think, first of all, the CapEx build-out continues. If you just look at the CapEx of the big hyperscalers plus Meta, um, they're building out you know, huge data centers. They're, they're buying uh, GPUs hand over fist. And so they're continuing that CapEx build-out. And there are still GPU shortages. When you talk to, remember, you know, right now, enterprise AI is like, I always say, it's very chatty. They're hitting singles. They're not really doing, you know, the, the big heavy work. So you got the cloud guys trying to compete with each other in an arms race. Now, <laughs> if it doesn't eventually pay off, there will be a crash. But it's not coming, I don't think, anytime soon because there's still GPU shortages. Enterprises who are hitting singles want to start investing in, you know, bigger bigger projects. And so what they're doing is they're going to the core weaves, they're going to the bedrocks from Amazon um, and Google uh, uh, and, and buying GPUs from those guys access. And so, so the demand is still there and there's pent up demand, I think in the enterprise, they can't get the GPUs to actually run on prem because they're in the queue unless they're, you know, huge supercomputer centers. And so I, I don't yeah. see that happening. I don't see it happening this year. I think I think you could be right, but I think it'll happen after Blackwell starts shipping and there's maybe a glut of, you know, H100s and H200s and, yeah, and I mean, hoppers. I mean, this is, well, there's a couple dynamics going on. One, there's demand for the GPUs and there's overcapacity and then the supply chain. So Blackwell slipping, that's their big flagship that's coming out, the so-called mother God box, God cpu but you got the h100 so the original h200 you get the super pod the base pod tensor core h200 so you have like that's like the a's and the double b's nobody wants the h100s if they got the h200s so you have all this kind of combination meanwhile you got companies like core weave and all these specialty clouds spending massive amounts of money okay massive financing a lot of it comes from private equity and some debt and they got to pay that back so if the game shifts they could collapse. So when I say the big short, I mean, it could not just supply the capabilities and the actual people that use them. So it's not, it's almost like underutilization meets the right applications aren't using the right thing. So it's like, it's like those, um, it's like the, it's like the mortgages, the, the triple A's, and then you got the dog shit at the bottom, right? Same is kind of happening in technology. At some point, obsolescence of chips is key and also adding in XPUs on the CPU. So if you look at all the architecture stuff going on right now, inference is the killer app training. when training goes away or gets basically done, that could cause a problem. And I bring this up because that means if companies are valued way too high to finance the, all these operations, either getting GPUs and building out these new systems, they might have the wrong design. Uh, and combined with, I like, got all this horsepower that's not used for the right application. Again, it's a very nuanced point. We're watching it closely, but there is a scenario that companies that are over investing on GPU based big gear is going to may crash. So I think that would help like the guys who are hoarding it, like Metas of the world and AWS. So we're, th this could be, this is new information to me uh, and I don't have it fully, you know, the puzzle solved, but the puzzles formed. I can see the edges. I can see most of the big pieces. And there's a scenario that says the GPU crisis is, could be upon us. And if that's the case, the consequences would be pretty grave on the infrastructure side for the startups that are over-investing. And when you have over-investment, that's a bigger numbers, which is bigger valuations, which means you got to drive more revenue and profit to pay back uh, the, the investors. Now, some investors are getting out their money in the, on the back-end rounds. So it's a really interesting kind of thing. I want to throw it out there because we'll see. You know, got Eric Schmidt saying billions are going to uh, uh, 200 billion, 300 billion on NVIDIA. You know what to do in the stock market. I'm not, I can't give investment advice. He was basically saying buy NVIDIA, Eric Schmidt on a video this week. Yeah. So, so, you be know, be and everyone because, is. Because the CapEx continues. I, I think, again, I'm not saying that you couldn't see eventually. Um, some kind of glut, but I see what I see is today's training chips are going to become tomorrow's inference chips. I think you're going to see prices drop on the existing ones, but and I think Blackwell's delay actually elongates the time before any, any crash would occur. And number one, number two is I think the, where the analogy doesn't hold is you know packaging um, you know credit default swaps you know crappy with crappy credit rating packaging you know, double B's and C's together to create the notion that it's diverse and fooling the credit agencies is a lot different than, hey, this is just an older chip 
you know, next uh, an N minus one or an N minus two chip. There's transparency there. It was a total lack of transparency in the big short. So I I, I do think to oh, your great. point though the, the creed is with a VC side. But, but, <laughs> but yeah, yes, but I do to your point. I do think that you know some of the core weaves of the world, not the core weaves in particular. I think you know they may who knows they may make make it through the knot hole. I don't think all of those. GPU clouds are going to make it through the knot hole because I think that eventually the the big cloud guys are going to, you know, d dominate as they often do. But I do think there's opportunities for specialists, but not ten or twelve of them. And I think that those guys could get could get hit, you know, when the music stops. Um, but I think for the cloud guys who are spending like crazy, they have so many other like lines of revenue that they'll they'll hide the fact that they're not getting a big return on the GPUs. Uh, on the ROI on the on the AI investments, and so what will happen, in my opinion, is the signal will be when they stop buying, when their when their capex starts to decline. That's when I think the big short is going to happen, and that yeah. just hasn't happened yet. Yeah, and and again, I, I, a lot of this came out of my interview with Matt Garman last Friday, which I'm going to publish on Monday, my exclusive one on one, great forty minute wide ranging conversation. Um, and we talked about the evolution of the enterprise and the, and, and the startup culture. Um, and then going to New York City for the NYSC and the Cube um, kind of opening up our studio there. Um, and talking around, the enterprise actually could be the catalyst to the crash because you don't have the big customers. And what we're hearing is on the semi side, there's like four, there's four customers, right? <laughs> we know who they are, maybe five, say seven. Okay. The rest is just application side of it. The enterprises are going to probably use a lot more distributed computing where you have edge. So, for example, we were talking with Cole Crawford from Vapor.io. He has a very intriguing business plan where he has edge capability that takes radio networks and ties it to, to the wired network. And he's essentially building an edge network, a whole other internet transit, which loads low latency. And you, I think you and I saw a demo of that. Um, if you have the distribution of the, of the workloads, you don't need the big horsepower except unless you're a monster provider like an Amazon or Meta, or if you're doing a monster AI um, computation. So the question I'm having is, will these big specialty clouds that are specializing on a GPUs, do they have the right GPUs? And two, are there enough customers? And then did they overbuy? So again, it's very complicated. We're going to track it, but I mean, I'll tell you right now, um, generative AI is more mainstream in the enterprise than ever before. Unprecedented opportunity in the space. It is a secular shift. I'm bullish on that. Security, reliability, a governance is going to be a big factor on expansion of the of the app. So I think that's going to be the thing. And Matt Garman and I, by the way, talked a lot about this. I asked him directly, you know, um, how are you guys going to play in the semi? He brought up Nitro, by the way, Dave. So um what do you say about what do you say about Nitro? He said Nitro is still core to their to their technology. Absolutely, and, and it's it's basically their Infiniband kind of model. They get the great performance with Nitro. They keep investing in it, and he was really adamant about Ethernet. By the way, so he was like really kind of not high on Infiniband. Not sure if he's well, taking a shot at Nvidia, but he's, oh, Nvidia is a great customer. Look at. They have great <laughs> architecture. <laughs> Everybody's trying to get a piece of the Nvidia pie, right? Wall a customer. I, uh, <laughs> so, wait, wait, wait. Uh, Nvidia is a great customer of ours. We're great partners with Nvidia. Meanwhile, like yeah, Broad, Broadcom says the same thing with, as they're throwing Infiniband under the bus and pumping. Right? I mean, we we've, we've heard that from Broadcom. But, hey, Nvidia is a great partner. They're our fastest growing customer. Like Ethernet's going to rule. I like Kamala Harris. Yeah. You know. So, but uh, but they're kind of both right. But I want to say something about Cole Crawford because what I loved about your interview with him, which 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 was uh, illuminating to me is he built out the local capacity before he built the, the, the national network. So he's, so that's was kind of a secret, you know, he built the last mile first, if you will, the hardest part first did the hard work first. One of my old, you know, bosses at computer world, um, used to say, I do all the hard stuff first in the morning, you know, all the tasks that I don't want to do, I do them right away. You know, Walter Boyd, he ran Computer World for years, and that was his style. And so that's what Cole Crawford did. He did all the hard work first. Not that it's easy to build on a global network, but now he's building the global network on top of that, and it's going to be layering services. So I, I thought that was pretty intriguing in terms of how you you brought that, you guys brought that out. But um, yeah, yeah. so I guess um, kind of you know, back to Nitro for a second. We called that um, years ago Amazon's secret weapon. And you remember Project Monterey that VMware had? 
Mm -hmm. That was their version of Nitro, um, which gave them sort of silicon optionality. Not that they're not going to have that, but but they're, you know, they, they just, that, that, I don't know what happened to that project. I mean, I think it disappeared. Broadcom may have killed it. I'm going to find out next, next week at VMware Explore. But so the, uh, the, the on-prem has created a substantially similar, similar operating model relative to the cloud. If you're running, you know, constant workloads on prem, it's going to be cheaper than you can do it in the cloud. If you got, you know, bursty workloads, or you're running, you know, a couple hours a day, you'd be better off in the cloud renting. But, but we know that the cloud is, you know, bills are racking up. And so, my point is that when you look at what's happening on prem, the on prem, you know, infrastructure is great now, but it doesn't have that same nitro secret weapon, and it doesn't have the custom silicon. So I would. I expect that some of the big players, maybe it's Cisco, Cisco already does its own silicon, but HPE has silicon chops. Dell could, it's got certainly got the resources. I expect some of these on-prem guys to start to partner up maybe with Broadcom to do more custom silicon because they're going to have to in order to keep their costs down, to, to get the price performance to where it can be competitive with the Gravitons and the Inferentials and the Traniums and, and Google GPUs and the Mayas from, from Microsoft. I mean, it's a trend that $100 billion companies like Dell and you know multiple tens of billions of dollars of companies like, like HPE and Cisco, you know, 40 plus billion, they got the resources to do this. And to, to me, John, to stay competitive with things like Nitro, and of course, AWS is a big lead, as do the cloud guys, but I think they're going to have to to go there to to remain competitive, yeah, and I think I think Amazon and others have to realize in the cloud players that it's distributed computing, and I think that the Nvidia push is clear; it's going to be distributed computing on premise as well as edge and cloud. So even Amazon, they're still they're still on that hill. What's cloud? And by the way, to the cloud, move to the cloud. And, so, and by the way, I'm, I'm not suggesting they can they're going to compete with Intel and AMD. No, I think they're going to identify specialized use cases. You just nailed it. Inference at the edge. Where they can add, you know, unique value, um, I mean, and 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 so the hard part is, it's so fragmented. It's hard to find a horizontal play. And Dell and HPE and Cisco, they need horizontal plays. But I, I really do believe that 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 trend will emerge where they can add significant value and and tune their 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 hardware and their software, their middleware on top of it, and and bring you know substantial advantage. I think the recurring theme of conversation is clearly the democratization of high performance computing or supercomputing to the masses. I think large scale GPU clusters in the cloud makes total sense. They have to make sure that they can actually deliver that to the on premise and edge because that's the key to success. So I think Amazon and Meta and Azure are all going to do great because, and, and I think the especially clouds won't get too hammered. I think that it, again, that scenario that I talked about, the doomsday scenario, the big GPU short, uh, will only happen if the stars line, if the market kind of crashes and there's no monetization. If the enterprise gets scared and these big apps aren't coming, then we'll see. Now, now that being said, the on-premise activity is high, and look at look at the work that Broadcom's doing, Nvidia's doing, uh, AMD. Uh, announced they're acquiring ZT Systems from C Caucus, New Jersey. Dave, C in New yeah, Jersey. Let's, on, can we talk about radar. that? Yeah, because it's very relevant to what yeah. you just said. Yeah, and this is what I want to get into because this is AMD has some GPU and FPGA chops as well as compute. And they haven't been advertising it because they got a big x86 market, but they offered 4.9 billion with another 400 million paid out based upon some performance during the close. That's close to 5.5 billion. Not a huge number relative to the mergers we're seeing these days, but this is interesting. You know, this is this is AMD is going hard, and and for people I'm talking to here in the valley, they have a chance. Now, I think Nvidia is baiting everybody into the trap, which is they already cracked the software game with CUDA years ago, and all their marketing is luring them into the market as fast as possible, um, and forcing you know diseconomies of scale, which I think they'll address in pipeline. So in their pipeline, so it's an interesting. AMD is formidable. So AMD has this. This is huge huge move and it's again another it's not like they're adding gps they already have capabilities uh, on that side so i i was psyched to see it it's part of their data center business again on premise uh, your, what's your take so i like the move but i think there there is a but to your point nvidia's got cuda it's got nv link and it has a systems business so 
NVIDIA bought Mellanox in 2019. And when they bought Mellanox, Jensen said that future data centers are going to look increasingly like supercomputers. So he had he had that vision before COVID. So he's got a five-year start on the market. He's been building systems. He makes this point that they build end-to-end -end systems and have been for quite some time. So that, and the importance of that is they're not just a chip company. When they sell chips, they can go in and consult with their partners, with their customers and say, look, here's what you need to do to get the most out of uh, these systems. And oh, by the way, if you want, we'll sell you the entire system. So it was interesting to hear Lisa Sue say, we're going to sell the manufacturing part uh, of ZT systems, which they're smart. They're going to delever and get some money back for that. Uh, but she's, her point was, we're not going to be competing with our customers like Supermicro. When in fact, Jensen and Lisa are competing in a way with their customers by building these full systems. Now, they're being pretty subtle about it. They're not, you know, making them. But I th I see that fabulous chip model coming to the systems business where, okay, maybe they're not going to manufacture and they'll outsource the manufacturing, but that systems expertise is becoming critical. So I think, first of all, it is a great move by AMD. Um, and, and it just makes them even more competitive relative to what's happening at Intel because Intel can't, it can't afford to do even, you know, its dividends anymore um, and build out its factory. So that's an advantage that, that Lisa's, you know, uh, taking advantage of. But I do think that NVIDIA still has a significant moat and at least a, a five-year advantage um, or more because uh, they've been, <laughs> they were first with the GPUs. And so they've really, really uh, are, have been able to fine tune that model. But I do like it. And it's a relatively inexpensive acquisition, but highly strategic and leverageable. And, and AMD is, AMD is just, Look at this. Scott McNeely said to me one time, there's always room for two, right? Always. <laughs> Every market, name a market. And I said to him, I said, what about ketchup? I says, just, just Heinz. And he looked at me, he goes, Del Monte, Dave. And so <laughs> I think I've told you that story yeah, before. No, that's a good story. There's always room for two. <laughs> well, let's talk about the story about uh, the Chinese entities turning to Amazon and other clouds to get access to high-end U.S. chips. You know, the chip ban's been on for a few years. Um, Reuters broke this story. Wall Street Journal's covering it. We're covering it. Obviously, we're we're close to this um, chip game. Um, they're building smaller language models, and they're using jurisdiction outside to get around the terms of service for things like Anthropic on Amazon, for example, and, and Azure OpenAI. They don't run in China. They have to have special things to run in China. So China's got the ban. They don't have the most powerful chips. They're building, they're building arbitrage with, with the smaller language models. That's the story that's coming out of Reuters. What's your take on this? Because, you know, this is interesting. They don't have yeah. all the big H, the H100s that they need or the H200s. Um, they want more NVIDIA and, they, and you know, NVIDIA chips and OpenAI chat GPT is banned by the U.S. Yeah, uh, I mean. So, so now, okay, circumvent, it's like, it's like uh, tax evading, avoidance evasion applied to GPUs. So, I mean, if the... The, the capitalist in me says, I, you know, I want to do business with China. I want the world to be in an open market, but China is a bad actor. You know, they're, 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 you know, hacking us. They're stealing IP, notwithstanding that U S stole a lot of IP when it was, you know, forming back in the 1700s, but that's what, that's what, you know, ascending nations do, but you know, we're on top now and China's stealing IP. Um, they're, they're, you know, major polluters and, um, they're bad actors. And so I, I, I think the government's right to do yeah. things like try to keep the chips out of their, the high end chips out of their hands. And I absolutely agree with what they're doing with, with, with at least putting some pressure on them about tick tick tock. I'd love to see, you know, people's Republic, uh, divest, allow them bike dance to divest. I don't think it's going to happen. Uh, but, but so, and I think that, you know, at the end of the day, China, eventually it might take 20, 30, 40 years. But eventually, they're going to do in chips and 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 tech what they did in steel. They, remember, they started out with rebar, and then they just kept going up the steel stack until you get to the point where and and the U.S. companies who were dominant in the steel business said, "Ah, eh, give them rebar, margin crap. We don't care about that." And then they just kept getting better and better and better and better because silicon's different, and there are a lot more choke points in silicon. Um, it's interesting, but this, this article, but, but is, you know, what's going to happen is the last thing I'll say is China's going to take over Taiwan and that's going to be their ACE in the hole. No, they're not going to go be Taiwan. They, they are. 
They, they are. They, they, they're going to do it eventually. They've they said they're going to do it, and I think you've got to take them at their word. And this is a huge, huge risk. So this is where Gelsinger you know, rightly laid out the scenario as to why we need to bring manufacturing back to the U.S. It's just... I don't workers. think China takes Taiwan. I don't. That's my well, what, okay. Look, what, what is the probability that China takes Taiwan? It's not zero, right? You agree? Yeah, I'd say 30%. Yeah, thirty percent. Still it's, high. It's, um, but, I mean, only because they, you know, they can cut the water off and choke all the manufacturing there. But they're too important in manufacturing. I think the world will will defend Taiwan and should should defend Taiwan. Taiwan how? Is a, how militarily? Mil, mil, yeah, militarily. Got policies. I mean, oh boy. So wait. Know. So play that scenario out. So China they basically want to get into surrounds. Open AI. Now you open up a throw. I want. I want to say one more thing, and then you like open up. Oh, Taiwan got to take over Taiwan. <laughs> okay, let's go. No, well, no. but so imagine China no, just, just mobilizes saying, and surrounds the You're island. An hour for the what Taiwan. if they surround this little island? Right? What happens? We just it's, send ships in, and the I mean, no, it's just it's just it's a huge problem because military force there would, would be bad. But maybe there's other factors. But it has to be defended, in my opinion, somehow. Again, I'm not a policy wonk, so I can't want to qualify qualify to talk on it, but. There's a huge conversation. I learned this during the pandemic when we were on the Clubhouse app. A lot of people from Taiwan, Americans and entrepreneurs. It's very capitalistic there, and they do not want to be bought, um, acquired, um, taken over by China because some it, do. It, it's it's communism. Some in Taiwan do. Uh, not that anyone I talk to. Maybe I'm talking. I don't talk to the people that want to be. Well, there's a faction, you know, that they didn't win the election, but there's a faction that actually wants to is is okay with being reintegrated so anyway I'll have, we'll have to bring in my friend steve chen he's one of my facebook buddies and he's founder of youtube he, he moved to taiwan he grew up uh, brought his family up there he would be a great person to, to get on the on the podcast i've only been taiwan. once i've only been once a long time ago and it was you know it's come a long way since then but you know it's look at it, it's a it's a it's another choke point right you got asml you got Taiwan, you've got the EDA manufacturers, the software manufacturers in the U.S. So it's not like the U.S. doesn't have leverage. Um, if, if, but, we, if, we, if China takes over Taiwan, that would be a major blow to the West because that is massive manufacturing, first thing with chips, and it's, and it's capitalism. So again, we should get someone to weigh in on this because I think it's a huge topic. And I've been on these club, the old one, Clubhouse is popular, but I still see the groups, the blogs out there and the forums they're always talking about this as a huge uh, fear yeah. that what happened in Hong Kong, it would happen in Taiwan. Total takeover, people getting killed, just shit changing big time. But look at, I think that's a really good point. Look what happened with with the Hong Kong. It was thought that, oh, well, Hong Kong will stay the open part of China. Well, look at it now. That, I, I think I think the same is going to happen. So we should put a pin in it because I'm really, uh, you're right, I'm not qualified to do you know deep geopolitics on Taiwan um but it's something that's well, obviously well this story got my attention because you know I I was over there when the when domain name system was rolling out and spent time there and dealing with the government 20 years 25 years ago uh, helped roll out the international domain name system with real names and that was a big problem that we just want to control everything and we could see how that turned into you know, all these kind of joint ventures but this article got my attention because two things one it was cloud related two it was chip related three it was china related and so it got my attention because with the chip ban, there's so much cloud demand in China because they have a huge amount of people. And the second thing is it's an exclusive. So what happened was all the PR departments were not prepared. So all the statements are classic. Here's one. OpenAI said in a statement, its own services are not supported in China and that Azure OpenAI operates under Microsoft's policies, period. It did not comment on the tenders. The tenders were the documents like they do with their procurement. And you get someone got a hold of this these documents for, for buying services. Okay, that statement right there means, I'll translate that. Okay, OpenAI, we wanted nothing to do with this. Talk to Microsoft. Microsoft, well, we have OpenAI. And then internally, they probably don't even have their shit together in terms of service. So there's a huge like arbitrage that I think China's doing. And then it says here, um, the university uh, was building a generative AI platform and purchasing 40 million Microsoft Azure tokens to support the project. Okay, in um, in in the, in the region, and this goes on and on, and then the U.S. government's basically, oh, then Amazon has offered um, organizations um, to advance chips, but advanced I models like Anthropic Claude, which by the way, Claude can't run in China because they don't have an agreement, so they're going through Amazon, and so, and then the Chinese are saying if they don't work, they will go into a different 
jurisdiction to get it. So Chinese are like, it's like, it's like electricity finds the ground. This is what's happening. It's just, it's causing all kinds of power dynamics. It's interesting to see so many storylines in this, in this little piece here um, uh, that we have to keep, keep an eye on. It's just, it's interesting. What do you do? I mean, do if, you think? Cat, if I'm selling stuff, I mean, the iPhone sold so many units over there. Apple had to look the other way. Um, Tesla for a while. Now Tesla's I mean, getting huge competition in China. Um, I mean, how, how do you think, let me ask you a question. How do you think, do you think the election will have any effect? I mean, Trump, obviously, one of the things that, that Trump obviously affected was the U.S.'s attitude toward China. It seems like it's 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 bipartisan. Certainly the bike dance thing was bipartisan. Do you think that it, that there will be a difference based on who is president, who was elected president, with respect to the posture to China? Or do you think it'll be similarly um, um, I negative? Think you think Trump will be more? It'll I be think, tariffs, I think, obviously. I think Trump will be a better deterrent than Harris, in my opinion, because uh, he has that um, posture. But the problem with Trump is he probably doesn't have, might, may not have the right advisors that execute. Trump, Harris, I don't think has the chops to have handled geopolitical things, in my opinion, but she's smart enough to have people around her that might know that. So you hope that you get the best people executing the day-to-day -day and get the right data to the president. And then ultimately, the presidents really don't make calls on this. Usually they're not even qualified. And Trump's not qualified. All he knows, I hate China. You know, it's like, you know, he went, I'll fight China. Now that, that will be a posture. If you remember Ronald Reagan, a Republican who essentially was very much a hawk, OK, um, Kamala Harris is a dove. She's going to be more you know, weaker internationally, in my opinion. I think Trump's a total hawk. He doesn't hide anything. Well, bomb the hell out of him. He'd say shit like that. Uh, Reagan was a hawk, but he wasn't as Trumpish. We got the we got the hostages back in Iran. Everything was like they, they were afraid. Of, people were afraid Reagan might pull the trigger again. He was an actor, kind of like Trump was. So, you know, that does have some deterrence, in my opinion. And but. Again, the problem is both these candidates I don't think have grasp of, of uh, international. Um, and I've always said that we need we need better people at the top. And 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 at the end of the day, Harris or Trump, whoever picks the best cabinets, some are saying that Trump's whole, you know, um, focus on being more of a hawk would be a better hawkish view. Harris, on the other hand, wants to like tax unrealized gains. So I don't, I don't, I think we'd be weaker internationally under Harris, in my opinion. Well, I'm just trying to think about the impact to, to tech, you know, tariffs obviously are inflationary, but Trump claims that they're uh, a negotiating lever. I hadn't really thought about that angle until I heard him, you know, say that. Um, so maybe, maybe there are, it's a short term cudgel. Um, I, I think Trump takes legit positions whether you like him or not, and follows through on it. He did it in his first presidency before he was attacked on the second year in. He did the wall. He did things. Now, did he do it right? Uh, did he do it elegantly? Did he do it with the right advisors? But he he didn't, like, flip-flop as much. He did lie a lot, but they all lie. <laughs> you know, so I just want real good people that are going to say what they're going to do and do it. If I vote for them because they say, you know, I'm going to not tax unrealized gains, um, I don't, that doesn't get my vote when someone I says just, I'm going to tax unrealized gains and things like that that just look different. But, but notwithstanding that, I'm just trying to think about the scenarios of China. China represents this huge market. Obviously, Apple has been able to tap it uh, really successfully. You look at companies like HPE, who had the joint venture. Of course, they had to sell 49% of it, and they're unwinding that now. So China is just becoming very insular, and I think that's causing the U.S. to become kind of maybe not xenophobic, but, but, but more protectionist. It's not, uh, and apples so, and, it's not apples and oranges. I mean, you have a, China is a communist state that organizes state resources, all resources controls them as, as one long game play. The United States has Lena Khan who wants to kill companies. Right? Right, and so I understand all that. I, we, we, and we have I, capitalism. I get, I get that, but I'm just trying to play it out, you know, five or 10 years, even 20 years. As to, okay, what does this look like? Because I, I do think that China, when it became the world's manufacturer, did so <clears throat> and created the perception that it was going to play nice. It clearly hasn't. Look what it did in Hong Kong. I thought that was a right on your the point that you made. So it seems just seems to me that China, their goal of of reducing their their dependence on the U.S., they're going to eventually get there. 
the U.S. is is having a hard time uh, reducing its dependence on on China as its manufacturer. India doesn't appear to be saving the day in any way. And so you play that out 20 or 30 years, I, I, it's just not a great scenario. Um, and I'm not sure tariffs, yeah, tariffs in the short term, maybe even the midterm I mean, might, I'm, I, might I help. Think, I think long term, Dave, you always have the right of view on this, and I will agree with you on this, that the U.S. should control its own destiny relative to manufacturing the future um, ingredients for the industrial nation of digital. And that's why I'm so, we had that big discussion about Bitcoin and, and um Mike Saylor's view, you know, I think corporations, I think, gets digitized. At the end of the day, digitization is coming. We're seeing digital twins. We're seeing all kinds of new physical hybrid models where digital starts to scale differently. Generative AI is showing applications of, of automation. So ultimately, and, and as the world politics change, maybe this is a feature, not a bug, that people are just going to have resource control. Um, and if, if controlling chips is one for the U.S., then like the automotive industry, you build chips here. Now, can we? Are we too lazy? Because look at TSMC. They try to do the plant in Arizona. They can't get people to work hard enough. Now, they, right. didn't, they didn't localize properly, maybe. But I think there's a, in the long game, I would support manufacturing in the United States because why did manufacturing leave in the first place? The price was too high for the products that they were selling. That was cars and other industrial stuff. But with digital, there's more productivity, get technology. So there's, there's an argument that you can make that long-term investment now and capture it back. I think that's the key. I think you just hit on the key is that that the, the only way this this doesn't become perpetually inflationary, this being you know the insular attitudes and protectionist you know uh, posture, the only way it doesn't become inflationary is if AI kicks in and drives you know a major productivity boom, which is of course the promise of AI. You know, David Floyer has has predicted that that we'll see a five to ten x reduction in the labor required to do today's tasks. You know, by I don't know five ten years. I mean, that's a five to ten x reduction in the number of people to do what it takes to do today. You know, you have ten people now. You can do it with one or two people. Start companies with one or two people as opposed to you know ten people. That kind of productivity hit would be exceedingly deflationary and be a huge win for the United States if it can get there first. Let's talk about VMware, okay? Because we have VMware Explorer. You wrote a post, a breaking analysis that got a lot of people talking um, on SiliconANGLE um, this past week. The title of it was um, Assessing Broadcom Dash VMware's Eight Months On. Um, I'm. We're going to have the cube there. It'll probably be the, the, the lowest participating cube from the ecosystem we've ever seen. Okay, in the history of our 16th year covering VMware Explorer and VMworld prior, Broadcom into the acquisition kept the community and the, the events because of the results from last year, which was actually phenomenal. It was great engagement. This year, because I think of the integration challenges, just internal operations, they screwed up a lot of things like the contracts for MDF and partners and all that good stuff that they do. And that can get kicked down the road. Finalized. Finally, we covered it here in Silicon Angle, and it looked. I like it, by the way. I was very bullish on 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 the the strategy, but Dave, almost too late. So yeah. we we might see kind of this transition year of the last VMware Explorer, or just a transition of the new contract relationships forming because Broadcom's clearly taking over. Um, it's it's very much got more parameters around it. So very interesting VMware Explorer, and that's that's my read. And you have more data. You wrote a post on this. Uh, what does the data share with you? Because I'm seeing, I'll see, I'm seeing VMware doing okay in some areas. Tanzu, we'll see how that goes. What's your what's your take in, and why and why the controversy? So the reason Rob Stretchy and I did this was obviously in advance of VMware Explorer, but you know our partner ETR, our survey partner, they they survey 1,800 accounts, you know, every quarter, a thousand. VMware accounts are in the data set. Now, the nuance is that the ETR methodology, it's called net score, measures the percent of customers that are spending more or less, essentially. And we've never, I've never seen um, performance the way that I'm seeing a couple of things. One is the percent of customers that are spending more on VMware. Again, this is not an indication of dollars spent. It's the percent of customers that are behaving a particular way. You're spending more, you're spending less. Are you adding the platform or you're leaving the platform? 
those those spending less, the numbers have jumped through the roof. Why? Because VMware has 500,000 customers and Broadcom's focused on, you know, the top of the pyramid, the top, you know, few thousand. And it's basically packaging up um, its offerings. It's taken what they claim was 8,000 SKUs down to like four. And it's saying, look, here's the entire bundle. Get the value out of the bundle. We're going to charge you for it. We're going to move you to a subscription model. So you, you're, they've done away with the all-you-can-eat perpetually model. Okay, so that freaked out a lot of customers. It pissed off a lot of customers, and it pissed off a lot of car partners because Broadcom basically said, "Hey, you know, we're gonna we're gonna select partners who are profitable, and you're not profitable. See you yeah. later." And so they pulled the rug out from under you know a number of partners who were you know again pissed off because their whole their business was around VMware. No surprise, by the way. But but the reason we wrote the post is because the interpretation of the data by many people was, wow, VMware must be in big trouble. Uh, absolutely not. This is exactly what Hawk Tan has been planning. You, you're going to focus. You're going to spend R&D. You, you can't continue to basically give away all this function in an enterprise license agreement and, and continue to fund the R&D roadmap. So his strategy was, let's narrow down the focus. Let's package up into what we call bundles. Some people didn't like that term, but they are. They're bundling, you know, everything. And then create VCF. That's the high-end bundle. And they're going out to customers and saying, look, you're using all this bespoke functionality anyway. You got vSAN, you got NSX, you have VMware Cloud Foundation, you have, you know, the security, you have all these capabilities. We're now going to package those up in a single SKU, and we're going to charge you not, we're not going to do an enterprise license agreement. We're going to sell subscriptions. We're going to shift to a subscription model. VMware was late in doing that. So we wanted to explain two things. One is, you know, VMware is doing exactly what it said it's going to do, and it's a frankly a winning strategy. The second is, it's leaving opportunities on the table, which is actually good news for the likes of Nutanix, that's the other thing. The Nutanix data is going through the roof. It's amazing how much, how many new customers they're 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 getting. Uh, as well, uh, OpenShift has a version that is basically a pretty simple virtualization, you know, horizontal move. So Red Hat and IBM are doing well, and they've got a more sophisticated AI platform, yeah. which is kind of interesting and and competitive. So we were trying to help people understand the dynamics of what's happening and give customers a recommendation of a don't freak out and say, you're going to rip and replace everything, especially your core systems, because you will screw up your business. So pay the Broadcom, you know, tax and move to the subscription model and just don't F up your business for those crap applications. Take them to Nutanix, take them to, to Red Hat, take them to open source, you know, KVM, or some other alternative that you know HPE has or SUSE has. There's a half a dozen alternatives out there which are perfectly viable. It, go for it. And th those are low risk migrations. And so we laid that out in a post. Um, and I guess the last thing I would say is we did a semi deep dive recently with with VMware on the TCO. And I'm I then I thought they did a really credible job of showing for those customers that are kind of all in on VMware, running core workloads on VMware, the TCO is actually pretty attractive. You're going to you're going to pay a little bit more in in because of the subscription. Um you're going to you're going to you're going to save uh if you consolidate uh the physical systems. Um and your overall TCO on a 3-year period is going to be better over a 5 or 10-year period. Yeah, you're going to pay more because it's subscription. It's subscription models. That's how they work. Yeah, I mean, I think I mean, we covered that in our, our event we had with them on the bundling. I think I was surprised about that Nutanix data you just shared. I would have thought Dell would be a better partner than Nutanix for um, doing that. Oh, let me um, explain that, John. Let me explain, explain that because because yeah. you have so, HPE as well out there. So you, I mean, yeah, so you're starting to see. <laughs> so so Dell, remember Dell had are they, VX. Are they are they sharks sharks circling or yeah, are they it, yes. Oh, you mean Nutanix and Dell. So remember Dell had has VX Rail, which is based on vSAN and it was kicking ass. I mean it was really really doing well. Well, you can't buy vSAN, you know, bespoke anymore. Now, whether or not VMware 
does a deal with Dell. We haven't seen it yet. At least I haven't. Um, but for now, VX Rail numbers in the ETR data set are tanking. And so what, what Dell has done is they just launched a deal with their former partner that was really good partner of theirs, Nutanix. They've reignited that partnership, which died basically when Dell bought EMC and owned VMware. Now it's alive again. Dell and Nutanix as partners are going to kick ass. Nutanix has a virtualization solution with Acropolis hypervisor. Dell has the greatest distribution channel on the planet, and they're going to sell a ton of this stuff. Now, here's the interesting thing, John. Dell's operating margins are like in the mid-single digits. Nutanix basically has no operating margin. The Broadcom's operating margins are like 60%. Okay, so it's a night and day. Broadcom's like, I don't want that 5% operating margin business, 6%, 10%, whatever it is. And Dell and, and Nutanix are like, wow, we'll take that. That's actually going to lift our product mix and going to improve our operating margins. And so to me, I see that as a win-win. Now, customers are going to endure some pain and the partners are going to endure some pain. But from the industry's ecosystem, I actually think it's going to work out pretty well because I think they're going to have more opportunity, not less. Yeah, and, and and again, I think this is going to be a very interesting show. This could be a transition year or the changing of the guard. Last year, I thought it was going to be this, but they had a huge international and domestic success in North America on the event. Remember, there's still a lot of people who still have VMware. But the question is that we're going to have to dig into is, are the prices really causing people to move? And the data that we're seeing in the survey data and our data we're collecting is that yes, people are looking at Nutanix, HPE, and Dell and Kubernetes. Yes. So so you're starting to see um the question, the strategic question is going to be, and I'm going to ask James Waters this and at Pranima um over there at VMware is can Tanzu survive and be that Kubernetes solution with and without VMware? Because there's a lot of a lot of discussion around do I need VMware to run Kubernetes? On, and kind of run it on bare metal. Rob Stretch had a long conversation about this. Um, they're winning big deals at VMware, Broadcom, Tanzu, where it's big platform engineering shops that they don't mind the license. They, they need it, and they're not going to move. So I think Broadcom has this in their master plan. I, you know, you know, Hock Tan is calculating. I think internally I'm hearing operations could be smoother because VMware is such a large scale, and Broadcom doesn't have that kind of scale except for the manufacturing chip side. So I think Broadcom's software group is has not used to the I mean, the girth of activity VMware has. I mean, if you're Broadcom, you have what? Semantic, CA, and now you got VMware. Just think about the little things. Their data center, their mail servers, their sites, everything that's everything's smaller and slower. And we know VMware 16th year covering them with the cube. It's a monster. VMware as a company, they've gotten bloated. But their core product and community is powering a lot of big companies, a lot of companies, huge community, a lot of developers, a lot of techies. Um, and that's not Broadcom. Broadcom's techies are on the chip side, mostly, except for Semantic and G CA. But it's a little bit slower market. It's like, you know, it's like it's like different league. The other, I think, I think, I think there's a lot of pressure around all the complicated things around VMware. Look how hard it is uh, the channel deals. All these just, it just grew like if, a if, monster. If you just Google Reddit, Broadcom VMware, you'll you'll see <laughs> where where customers' heads are at. Okay, most of the customers are like, you know, we're we're out of here. We're pissed. Um, just again, most of the customers. It's the top of the pyramid that these guys are going after, but. And, and the other piece is, look at here are your choices. Go to Nutanix in a horizontal move, or or you know low cost open shift. Move to the cloud. If if you're running VMware, you're either running Windows or Linux workloads. <laughs> okay, so go to Hyper V or whatever they call it now. Um, and so they're picking up business. You Amazon's tame, you, you can't tame the beast, Dave. Well, well, Broadcom's taming the VMware beast. So so oh. in, in AWS. VMware Cloud on AWS, they're going to pick up a bunch of that business, and Broadcom's going to keep the tip of the pyramid. And so, you know, oh, customers are are feeling it right now, but they'll they'll sort it out. It's this is not the end of the world for them. I mean, there's just in business school, there's two strategies: you burn it to the ground, or you ride the wave. It's on. Okay. So yeah, you're saying yeah. people are going to ride the the no, transition. Burning, wave. The one scenario is that it has to be burnt and rebuilt. Wait, what has to be burnt and rebuilt? VMware. VMware? 
Yeah. Well, well, that's well, what kind of I mean, doing, right? Well, they're 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 basically taking the 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 large percentage of nonprofit. They brought, do the bell curve. They're saying, look. 80 percent of our profits are coming from probably 10 percent of our customers let's focus on those 10 percent of the customers or two percent of the customers and then spend r d on a roadmap keep those people locked in in perpetuity that's a classic move the difference is people think of broadcom as like an old school pe that just sucks the carcass out or you know sucks the money out and then leaves the carcass that's not what they're doing they're they're okay, narrowing okay. the they're narrowing the invest. It's smart. They're smart business people. They're narrowing down the investment, and they're going to mine that in perpetuity. And and because, what's the what's the alternative to, to cloud for on prem? You know, you're going to. I think I think Broadcom is not gutting VMware. I think they're smart because look, if you're VMware, if you're Hoctan, and we talked about this on another pod, we'll just say it again because it's worth saying. They have two businesses, chips and software. Semiconductors, which is actually exploding in value. All of the Inway people are rich now who stayed because of the stock appreciation. They're thrilled. They're okay. RSUs. No they're one's pumping. complaining. Fuck the customer. That's what they're saying. <laughs> <laughs> no, they're saying we'll deal with the customers, right? They're not, no, no, I'm just kidding. It's a little bit <laughs> Hey, I'm just making more cash. You know, hey, smoke another one. Um, no, seriously, they understand this. The cyclical market of chips and software are like really one-two punch. So from an earnings standpoint, if you're doing the math, you say, okay, I'll ride both cycles. Chip cycle goes up. If there's a big short or any kind of dip, software kicks. Because when chips mature, software accelerates. Uh, that's just kind of rule of software, kind of how we the industry goes. Software economic, marginal economics kick in. Hopefully they can clean house by then. So right now they got a lot of problems. VMware has a lot of things to fix inside the new Broadcom VMware. Everything is breaking. And by the way, that's from what I'm hearing and reporting. That's the way Broadcom is. They fix shit. They break, fix it. Well, let it break first, then fix it. So that's what's happening. A lot of stuff's breaking, Dave. And they're fixing it. Well, so, I do think the know. I do I do think the support model yeah. for a lot of customers is not optimized. Let me just put it that way. Well, I mean, okay. I can tell you right now, the channel guy that was on the cube. He passed my test, and that that story hung together. The architecture of their of their partner strategy was just designed well. It's laid out right. They had the, the the big SIs. They picked a few, but the channel with the with the distributors, it all looked good on paper. It it was solid, in my opinion. Executing that from where it was again, growing pains, pull the pulling that change forward, <laughs> pain. Before pleasure, I guess. I just, I just want to emphasize for those people out there, and there is a narrative that all oh, Broadcom's effing things up. Well, they're certainly disrupting things, but they are not effing up. They are executing their plan exactly how they said they're going to execute it. They wasted no time. They had a plan. They're executing that plan. I, I think that plan is going to work, and I think it creates opportunities for IBM Red Hat, Nutanix, the cloud guys, and um, and you know, certain partners. And so, and, and even to a certain extent, SUSE, and no, no question, HPE is in the mix. Services companies, um, managed service providers who want to help customers, who, okay. customers need help managing their, their transition. Um, so, it's so it's going to be all, all okay, I promise you. Say, so next week, you got VMware Explorer, which is which just been, did, did, did a did deep dive on, our commentary at least. Um, um, there's going to be a chip show in Cupertino that Jensen's going to be speaking at and NVIDIA's going to be talking about. But earnings next week, go through the list. NVIDIA, Salesforce, CrowdStrike, Dell, NetApp, Pure Storage, HP, not HPE, MongoDB, HashiCorp, and more. So we'll see another wave of results come in um, next week. NVIDIA oh. certainly will be one. Obviously, based on the straight line a couple of days ago, went straight up. I'm not looking like people might have some sense that was going on there. Salesforce. Is totally transforming. We we have to do a whole segment on that next next week. I'm doing uh I'm doing um breaking analysis today on that. I mean, not just Salesforce, but on the whole the transformation of the application yeah. stack as a result of Agentic AI. And Salesforce is one of the leaders there. By the way, I got data on CrowdStrike. CrowdStrike announced next Wednesday. Okay. Right, and, the, and the stock's been acting really well. Okay. But I think what's going to happen, I know what's going to happen. Is so remember the the incident occurred at the end of the quarter, okay? So it 100% affected their quarter. And everybody knows this. 
because you do most of your selling in the last month of the quarter. Okay. And they, their quarter is going to be effed up. No question about it. So they are going to have to take down significantly their forecasts for ARR. ETR did a flash survey the day that the incident occurred to a hundred accounts that were affected. They just updated it. Okay. And I'll tell you, I'll just give you one data point on a scale, give you a couple actually, because this, this is good. On a scale of one to six, how significant was the impact of these outages, the business operations? The percent of customers that said very significant went from 40% to 51% in July to August. And then the percent that said somewhat significant went from 22% to 28%. The percent that said somewhat insignificant dropped from 21% to 10%. So, okay. So it was a bigger impact than people realized. Okay. And then they asked, this is, this is the, the, the kicker uh, or the ace in the hole for CrowdStrike, how difficult it is to, to replace CrowdStrike if you had to. Pretty difficult, like yeah. 60, 60, 80, 80% say it's pretty difficult. And then, but people are rethinking, unquestionably rethinking. The percent that said we're, we're, we're unlikely or very unlikely to uh, re uh, replace uh, CrowdStrike went down, very unlikely up, unlikely, somewhat unlikely down. So people are rethinking. They're like, it's hard to do, but we are reconsidering CrowdStrike. So the bottom line, my takeaway is there's no question it impacted last quarter. So the numbers are not going to be good. And there's no question in my mind that George, George Kurtz is going to be transparent and humble, and he's going to reset his ARR forecast. And they're going to start building up again from there. So the stock's been acting really nicely lately. And I think, ah, I think the message is going to be, look, we've got to reset. And we're really sorry. This is what we've done. I think there's exposures in terms of what they're offering people, they're still negotiating. Mm -hmm. uh, there's one question in here, you know, uh, uh, what have they offered you? Discounts, um, they're offering us maybe direct compensation, discount on renewal, uh, direct compensation, more favorable terms, and 50% say we're still negotiating. So it's it's the next, next several quarters are going to be a reset for CrowdStrike. That's great, Jade. I'm really glad we went the extra minutes there. Uh, and then NVIDIA's got the hot chip 20, 2024 semiconductor technology conference in Cupertino. Um, um, they, they put details out. They go to siliconangle.com. That story's there. Some stuff on agents and Blackwell are on, in the story. Go to siliconangle.com for all the top stories and action. Thecube.net for all the Cube videos and Cube program. We didn't get into the big NYSE week. Um, uh, tr uh, Trinity Chavez, Brian Bauman, the whole team in New York was awesome. We're going to have our set there. Set one is open now, and we're going to have to get that. We're going to trickle some content, and then set two will be built out. That's going to be a full build out with two sets on the New York Stock Exchange floor for Cube East Mega Pop. Super node, Silicon Valley, New York, and then Austin linking Boston. We'll hit other areas too in the future. We'll keep expanding the cube infrastructure footprint. It allows us to get local communities, Dave, in these markets. It can be fun. And, and the re response was phenomenal. I had I, Einstein of, of Wall Street, um, met him. He's famous, huge social media um, presence, footprint. Great guy. I mean, the guy smiled. He's, he's just happy around him. I, I mean, met him for the first time, and I kind of knew who he was, but I didn't really know of him much, but I liked him. He was cool. He smiled, made me happy, took a selfie with him. Apparently, he doesn't really offer selfies, but I got a selfie with him. So. You recognize him because he's got Einstein hair, and they always yeah. take pictures of him. When the market's blowing up, they show him going up. Yeah, yeah. he's, he's <laughs> on fire. He's also got some good smile. When the market's up, he's crazy, too. So uh, he's a great guy. And then just overall, just the vibe, the, the, the networks of the Cube and um, the New York community through NYSE's Wired community. It's just, there's a lot of complementary executive synergies and it's just another elite group of great people that have been following the cube. Some know more, some know less, some don't never heard of the cube and vice versa, just that connection. So we're going to see a lot more of this um, super nodes. Yeah, you know, super nodes, Dave, goes with super cloud, which is a thing. And super cloud, it has super apps and super nodes. Super cool. All, co all cube is local. <laughs> <laughs> all right uh, next time dave we'll see you later have a great weekend i'll see you Thanks, uh, in vegas yep see you out there john